1982. The century-old Hoya watch company is in crisis. New technology and new competitors have eaten into profit margins. The head of the company, Jack Hoyer, scrambled to save the business. But it was too late. A task force was appointed to decide the company's future. Jack Hoyer was not on it. On Friday, the 25th of June, 1982, Jack was relieved of his position. And for the first time in its 120-year history, there was no Hoyer in charge of the Hoyer Watch Company. Jack was born in Bern, Switzerland on the 19th of November, 1932. He was christened Jack William Edward Hoyer. Jack for a beloved Scottish cousin, William in honor of his maternal grandfather and Edward for his great grandfather, the watchmaker who had founded the family business in 1860. Like his great grandson, Edward was an innovator. In 1887, he patented his most important invention, the oscillating pinion, a new mechanism of great precision and efficiency. It remains a key component in mechanical stopwatches to this day. As the company grew, Edward was joined in business by his sons and grandsons. Aged just 15, young Jack was soon to make a crucial contribution of his own. Walter Haynes was the president of American sports outfitter Abercrombie & Fitch. At a meeting with Jack's father, Charles-Edouard Hoyer, Haynes had requested a new watch, one that could predict the tides. He had no idea how to make such a thing. That is when young Jack intervened. He knew a man who would have the answer. His brilliant school physics teacher, Dr. Heinz Schilt. Jack put his father in touch with the scientist and, with Shields' help, the company was able to create the tide watch Haynes had wanted. They called it the Solunar. It was Jack's first step into the family business. He had much further still to go. Jack arrived in New York in March 1959. He had just made one of the biggest decisions of his life. Well, my father and his brother had been sent to America. So it was in the family tradition that one goes to America to learn about the world. An ambitious young man, he had been unsure whether the life of a minor Swiss watchmaker was for him. Analysis of exports had revealed American operations to be woefully inadequate. The enormous US market was almost entirely untapped. In response, the company made the daring move to set up its own sales office in New York, and Jack was put in charge. Unexpected costs threatened the venture almost before it got off the ground. But Jack persevered. New products were offered, promotion was stepped up. Within a couple of years, he had turned the American operation around. But events at home now threatened his success. My father sent me a telegram, there were no faxes or emails. He said, come home at once, Hubert wants to sell the company. And uh, next Monday morning, I was in the office of my uncle and said, I want only go back if I have the majority of the company. I don't want this to happen again. Borrowing money from the banks, he made Uncle Hubert a generous offer for 10 of his 50 shares. With a further 41 gifted from his father, Jack had over 50 shares in total. Aged 28 and with just two years experience, Jack was now head of the Hoyer Watch Company. The immediate future of the business seemingly assured, he returned to the United States and continued his work. There I learned everything about marketing. The world didn't even exist in Europe. 
There's so many ways you can push and promote a watch or a stopwatch. I found out what the, what the property master has for an influence on the films that he is the one who decides. So then I found a property master and nobody else had a property master in the watch industry. A deal with Hollywood props master, Don Nunley, meant Hoyer chronographs were also seen on the wrists of stars, but the great triumph of all came in 1970. During the filming of Le Mans, Steve McQueen went to great length to imitate his driving coach, a racing car driver who wore a Hoyer chronograph on his wrist and its logo on his overalls. In the film, McQueen did the same. That coach was Joe Siffert, a 34-year-old Swiss driver who had shot to fame after winning the 1968 British Grand Prix. Hoyer was his sponsor. Jack had always loved motoring and as far back as 1959 had noted the popularity of Hoyer chronographs at the Monte Carlo rally. But it was the partnership with Siffert that brought Hoyer and the world of racing together formally for the first time. Giving a watch to Joe Siffert, the interesting deal I made was that I allowed him to buy our chronographs wholesale. He placed in all of the teams of Formula One with the mechanics, with the team, sh showed these guys that how useful it is and that you can get them at a special price through Joe Siffert. We didn't realize how important that could be, but at the end of the day, it was a big success. Typically, Jack was quick to build relationships in this new arena and put them to good use. In 1971, Hoyer signed a deal with Ferrari. The deal with Ferrari was relatively simple. We would make and develop for him uh, an electronic timing system to time the Le Mans races, because he was absolutely sure that the French were cheating in the 24 Heures du Mans, and therefore he didn't trust their timing. So we came up with phenomenal modern electronic timing system. This new device was capable of precision timing several cars simultaneously. The watch company agreed to provide the apparatus free of charge, ensured that, like Joe Siffert, Ferrari's F1 drivers would wear the Hoyer logo on their overalls. It was not long before Ferrari's competitors wanted the innovative new Santigraphs for their teams as well. On film and on the track, the Hoyer watch company was grabbing attention. But then, tragedy struck. On the 24th of October 1971, Joe Siffert crashed his car, racing at Brands Hatch, England. Unable to escape the burning vehicle, he was killed. Siffert was 35. Mourning the loss of the young man, Jack changed Hoyer's policy. No more would the company sponsor individual drivers competing in such a dangerous sport. But the love for motoring he had shared with Siffert meant Jack could not end the association completely. The cars themselves would still bear the family name. And Jack continued to push advances in high-speed timekeeping. For Hoyer, innovation went beyond technical advances. The design of a watch on the outside mattered as much to Jack as the complex mechanisms found within. Inspired by designers such as Le Corbusier in the early 1960s, Jack had sought to use the latest technology to create a modern watch with a clean and elegant face. I got courses on how the legibility of analog dials are done and I applied those legibility factors to the dials of the chronographs. My proudest moment is obviously that I created the Carrera because it's still the icon watch of the brand today. 
Released in 1963, it is now acknowledged as one of the most iconic examples of Swiss watchmaking in all history and is highly prized by aficionados and collectors worldwide. Despite the success of the Carrera, nobody at Hoyer was complacent. Jack always looked to the future. By the late 1960s, technology had advanced to the point where an automatic self-winding chronograph was possible. Possible, but expensive. Too expensive for Hoyer alone. Jack approached fellow watchmaker Breitling. Splitting the costs, the rival companies began work on what they called Project 99. For two years, they toiled in absolute secrecy. The result was an entirely new movement that filled one of the last major gaps in mechanical watch technology. They dubbed it the Caliber 11. One of Hoyer's suppliers then approached the company with a new design for a square watch case. Jack at once saw the potential. A square chronograph would instantly distinguish Hoyer products from those of co-developer Breitling. The Calibre 11 movement and the square watch case together became the Monaco chronograph. Once again, innovation in technology met innovation in design. As the 1970s dawn, the company went from strength to strength. Despite the success of the previous decades, by 1982, Hoyer was at its lowest ebb. The growth in quartz and digital watches meant the Swiss were being left behind. I was wrong in judging the effect of the quartz watch. The one minute accuracy per week was basically very good. And then quartz comes and says it's two seconds per month. This new technology soon left Hoyer fighting for their existence. A task force was chosen to decide the company's future, while Jack desperately sought money to turn the company around. But his fate had already been decided. On the 25th of June, 1982, Jack was forced to leave the 120-year-old Hoyer watch company. Heartbroken and exhausted, with his wife and three children, he sought refuge in Puglia. I was very lucky because I was engaged before once, but in my second engagement I was really lucky. And she held through the up and the downs of my life. I needed somebody like her, especially just starting again from scratch. He decided he would put his expertise and experience to work. He looked to the future. In 1983, Jack became the European representative of Integrated Display Technology, a Hong Kong-based electronics firm. He would go on to work with them for the next 20 years. However, despite his new employment, Jack could never forget the company that still bore his name. In 1985, the company was bought by Saudi business group TAG. They built on the innovative approach of Jack decades before. TAG Heuer, as the company was now known, increased advertising expenditure to 20% of turnover. Although a move later copied by other luxury watch manufacturers, at the time it was considered revolutionary. The brilliant marketing campaigns that followed drove the company to new heights. The value of Tag Heuer soared. In 1999, it was bought by French luxury goods conglomerate, LVMH, whose subsidiaries include Louis Vuitton and Dior. In the early 80s, Jack had struggled to raise even 2 million francs to save the company. Now, it was changing hands for 900 million. Jack was approaching 70. Thoughts turned to a relaxed retirement. But the relationship with his old company was not finished quite yet. In the summer of 2001, Jack was invited to meet Jean-Christophe Babin, the new CEO at Tag Heuer. The pair got on well and were soon exchanging ideas for new chronograph ranges. 
Jean-Christophe then made Jacques an offer he could not possibly turn down. Honorary chairman of Tag Heuer. Retirement, it seemed, would have to wait. For the next 12 years, Jack crisscrossed the world. He met Tag Heuer clients and brand ambassadors and gave countless press interviews. Gosh, I never sp spoke to a crowd as big as this, I must say. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. He took special interest in the creation of the Tag Heuer Museum, donating numerous items from his private archives to the exhibition. In 2012, Jack was nearing his 80th birthday. But he was still at work, this time on a very special, limited edition chronograph, the Jack Hoyer Carrera. It was designed by the man himself. I insisted to have the registers at nine, at three o'clock and at nine o'clock. It has my signature in the back and the family crest, which dates back to the 16th century. Just 3,000 were made. The company soon sold out. Jack's time at Tag Heuer was drawing to a close. He had seen it transformed from a small family business to an international prestigious brand. It had been an era of triumphs and innovation, of setbacks and renewal. But come success or failure, one thing held true. Whatever the pressure, Jack Hoyer never cracked.